Hello everybody, it's lovely to be here with you. How is everyone feeling? Any, yes? Tired, I bet you're feeling tired. I bet you're not only feeling tired from the journeys that you've taken, but also from the emotional journey that you've, you've taken for being here. And it's a great privilege to be here because you are the generation that is going to have to sort out the mess that my generation has made, for which huge apologies. Anyway, I thought I would start. Where's the PowerPoint? Up there, yes. I'm gonna, I've got, I put together some slides. I will talk about those slides and there will be time afterwards to have a conversation. So if I say anything that doesn't make sense or that you want to know more about or that you want to challenge, make a note of it and I, I promise we'll have time afterwards. So I thought I would start with my own story. So I really exist today only because of compassion. My father was a child during the rise of Hitler. He lived in Vienna, Austria, and when the Nazis came to power, he had to flee as a child for his life. He was put on a train as a child without his parents. He said goodbye to his family, and he was put on a train called the Kindertransport, which took him and 10,000 other Jewish children to safety in Britain. And but for that train, which wasn't started by the government, it was started by a group of volunteers who could see what was happening, just as we can see what is happening in Gaza today. They could see what was happening in Germany and Austria. And the government wasn't acting, but they decided to act. So they saved the lives of 10,000 children and it's because of that act of compassion that I exist today and that my children exist today and that my family exists today. And in the Holocaust, this is what would have happened to him. One and a half million Jewish children were slaughtered. And I stand here today as the daughter of a Jew to say that I am so horrified and heartbroken by what I see happening in Gaza. And the point of today, the point of us being here is so that we can prevent these horrific outbreaks of cruelty and inhumanity happening and so that we can build peace. So the generation now, we thought at the end of the Second World War that it would never happen again, but we look now, we have refugees fleeing in fear of their lives, drowning at sea. In the Mediterranean, we have the captains that pick up and rescue the refugees who set sail being criminalized for trying to save the lives of those who are drowning. We have hunger, we have homelessness, we have runaway climate change. This is not meant to uplift you, it's just to give you a snapshot of, of how well we're doing as humanity in terms of leadership at the moment. And we have an economic system that is based largely on a doctrine that disseminated from the United States and, and Britain and many other countries have embraced it of neoliberal economics, which really functions on the idea of trickle-down economics, which is if we can make the wealthy wealthy enough, it will somehow trickle down and improve the lives of everyone. Now, what we know is that levels of poverty have risen but at such a slow rate compared with how they could have risen, I mean, levels of, t of getting rid of poverty, we, we, are, we are making inroads with poverty, but we could be doing so much more if we didn't have this doctrine which just said we relied upon the droppings from the rich person's plate. And then just to finish this short kind of snapshot of where we are, I'll give you a quote from um, Tolstoy, the um, Russian author of Anna Karenin and many other great works. He says, I sit on a man's back, choking him and making him carry me, and yet assure others that I am very sorry for him and wish to ease his lot by all possible means, except by getting off his back. And that is what we see in terms of global leadership today. We say, we see leaders who say it's terrible that runaway climate change is happening, it's terrible that war is happening, it's terrible that such gross inequality is happening, it's terrible that 
millions die avoidably from preventable causes. We're terribly sorry, but we're not actually going to take the actions that will prevent that suffering happening. And that is what needs to change. And why does it need to change? Because these injustices are what fuel conflict. While we have inequality, while we have hunger, while we have an uneven distribution of resources, we will have conflict. And how does that make us feel? Heartbroken, but sometimes very, very angry. And I imagine after what you have all heard here today over the last two days, that many of you will be feeling really angry. You may not look like that. That's a picture of me when I'm angry. But you may feel that. And anger is a really useful engine. It's what we use to drive change. But we have to be very careful with anger. We have to be very careful. We use anger to drive change, but we cannot allow it to become hate. I've got a confession to make, apart from looking like that when I'm angry. Um, I've got an addiction. Um, I, I am addicted to sugar, cotton candy, ice cream. <laughs> Anyone else share those addictions? Okay, I see a lot of women putting their hands up. The men are kind of, maybe. Anyway, this is not a, this is not a gendered subject. Many of us have sweet teeth. But I'm making a serious point, which is that I, I have had an addiction for most of my life. So, so my working life has been around compassion. I began, as, as Sharon said, as a barrister, as a lawyer, trying to kind of progress right. Then I went into journalism. I was a campaigning journalist, and I broadcast around the world and I had a camera crew and I had an audience of millions and what I wanted to do was show where people were wrong, where people were doing the wrong thing. And of course, in doing that, I was really saying that I am right. And I reduced things down to a very simple binary situation of right and wrong. And unfortunately, the truth is often a lot more complex. But like many of us, I suspect, in this room, I had an addiction to being right. And that addiction solved a psychological need in me. Because if I was right, then it kind of gave me some consolation for the suffering and the inhumanity that I saw in the world. If I knew who was bad, then I also knew what was good. And um, I just want to move on to the problem with that. Um, here's Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So being right and having hate for those who do wrong is not the answer, unfortunately. It's more complicated than that. And here we have Gandhi who said, an eye for an eye, and the whole world goes blind. So it is not enough to know. If we want peace, it is not enough to know that others are wrong, because that perpetuates the conflict. And many of us who are on the side of peace talk about peace, and yet in our minds we are creating others. You know, we may oppose the othering that takes place. Look at what Trump tried to do to build a wall, to create a wall between America and others. We know the hate that comes from othering. And yet those of us who are on the side of peace can inadvertently do that within our own heads and within our own thinking. So if we want to be peacemakers, we cannot resort to hate. And that's tough. That's really tough. When we see the appalling, atrocious things that are happening around the world, when we see children being slaughtered, when we see innocent people losing their lives, being deprived of all that they hold dear, it is very difficult not to turn to hate. So before we go to the solutions, I just want to talk about how understandable it is that we turn to hate. Because hate serves a number of purposes. 
It makes us feel stronger. You know, when we feel hate, we feel energized. We feel powerful. We feel strong. Being right makes us feel that we have the moral high ground. We're somehow morally more valuable. Hating makes us feel less vulnerable. It makes us feel less powerless in the face of wrong. It makes us feel as if we're somehow able to do this. And it gives us the illusion of simplicity, that really it's just a matter of looking at two sides, deciding who's right and who's wrong, and picking between them. But that's really just fueling the conflict. And it gives us an illusion that there's an easy answer. So to go back to that image of the ice cream, I always think that hate is a little bit like sugar. It's really sweet. We get buoyed up by it. We can get a little bit high on it. But then we crash because it doesn't actually provide any long-term solutions. All it does is create and perpetuate the divide between us and the other. So if hate isn't the answer, then what is? I'm just, I just want to just give a little caveat before I move on to what the answer is, and that is anger. You know, there's a difference between anger and rage. Anger is the raw emotion we feel when we know something is not okay, when our boundaries have been violated or when the boundaries of others have been violated. And that's important. Anger is the energy that will drive us onto the streets, that will drive us to the ballot box, that will drive us to take the action that is necessary to change things. But anger is not hate. If we don't express our anger in a healthy and clean way, it can turn into rage and it can turn into resentment and it can turn into hate. And when we start getting high from our anger, then we know we're in danger. We have to be aware of our own psychological response. So anger, yes. Rage and hate, dangerous ground for all the reasons that I've outlined because we cannot cure hate with hate. We become part of the problem. The moment we pick up our club of righteousness, we become part of the problem. So what is the answer? The Sufi poet Rumi, Rumi has this wonderful saying, and it, that's what I really want to talk about uh, as peacemakers. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field, and I will meet you there. So how do we move beyond the labels of right and wrong to that place where we can actually just meet each other as fellow humans and recognize the humanity of all of us whichever side, life, geography, birth, psychology has put us on. How can we move into that space? So for me, compassion is the catalyst for peace. Compassion is a, a, compass, a, is a capacity that all of us have. It's innate. Psychologists have studied us, evolutionary psychologists, and we know that at the age of roughly 18 months, every single one of us will have expressed and experienced compassion. So it's in there, but what happens is it can either be cultivated and amplified by the culture we live in, by the kinship group we live in, by the country we live in, by the group that we associate with, or it can be blocked and inhibited. I'm going to talk for a moment about what compassion is, and then we're going to look at what compassion can do. So compassion is a three-stage process. It is an awareness of another's suffering. If we don't know that someone else is suffering, we're not going to be compassionate. And so if we blink at ourselves, if we stay in our bubble, if we shut ourselves off from what is happening in the world, we're not going to know that other people are suffering. If we shut ourselves off from knowledge of the Holocaust, we're going to find it a lot harder to understand the suffering that is driving the hate that we're seeing right now in the Middle East. We have to have some awareness of the suffering of others. And we cannot begin our journey to become real peacemakers until we attempt to be aware of what others are living with. And it won't be the same as what we're living with. We each have our own experience. You know, if we take, 
Well, take my face, okay? I'm going to look this way. All of you are looking at my face, but the people who are looking at it from this side are going to see one section of face. The people who are looking at it from that side are going to see the left-hand side of my face, and you're all going to see my lovely long nose looking straight ahead at me. So we're all looking at the same thing, but we've all got slightly different perspectives and slightly different angles, and so much more so when we're looking from different sides of a division. So part one of practicing compassion is awareness. Part two is, is having empathy, is rowing ourselves over to where the other person is. How would I feel if that were my situation? How would I feel if I had had those experiences and perceived myself to be in that space? Um, and, and what happens is empathy, if you were walking down the street and someone collapsed in front of you, um, I dare say most of you, let's do a hands up. Um, how many of you, actually, I'm going to do another thought experiment. This is from a philosopher called Peter Singer, who actually started the animal liberation movement in the United States. Has anyone heard of Peter Singer here? Very important political philosopher in America. Okay. So Peter Singer says this, he says, I want you to imagine you're going for a walk, you're on your own, you're in a woodland, and you see a small pool of water, and you notice that a toddler has fallen over into that pool of water and is face down and can't get up. You look around, there is no one else around. What are you going to do? What would you do? Anyone want to tell me? Yes? You save the toddler. You save the toddler. Yeah, it's obvious, isn't it? You save the toddler. Okay, so let's rewrite this story. Correct answer. Thank you. Let's, and I assume everyone would have given that answer, otherwise I'm not sure why we're all here. So, so let's slightly modify that, and let's imagine that we are walking through this wood because it's a shortcut to get to a really important job interview. And this job interview is going to change our lives. It's going to change the lives of our family. And because it's such an important job interview, we have spent all our savings buying the most incredible suit or outfit, perfect shoes, perfect everything so that we look the business and we're going to get this job. And we're slightly late. So we are rushing through the woods on our way to this job interview and we pass the same pool of water and there's a toddler face down in the water. They're in the middle of the water and it's not so deep that we're going to drown but the water is deep enough so that we're going to ruin our shoes and the bottom half of our suit and we look around and there's no one else to go in and save that toddler. What do we do? Save the toddler, thank you. Thank you. We save the toddler because nothing is more important than life. That's correct. And also, you probably shouldn't have Yeah, and you probably shouldn't have the job unless you're going to a certain kind of work, which we're not going to talk about here, in which case it might make you perfectly suited. I'm going to tell you something about economists in a minute without being rude about economists because some of my family are economists. Um, so, so yes, you save the toddler, but the truth is that other people's children are dying and drowning every second of the day, and we have the capacity to save them, and we're not. We buy a cup of coffee that we don't really, really need. We could have made a cup at home, or we're not really going to finish it, or we've just got half an hour to kill, so we think we'll get a cup of coffee. And the price of that cup of coffee is enough to save a life somewhere else in the world. So there is an empathy gap. We care, and we know we care, but the greater the distance, the harder it is to care. And we have to carry that awareness with us. Because our job as peacemakers is to not let that distance affect our empathy. We cannot afford to have that empathy gap. And our job as peacemakers is to help the world close that gap. You know, why? We say we believe in equality, but why does that child in front of us, why does my child matter more than the child on the other side of the world, or my mother, or my sibling, or my grandmother, or my grandfather? You know, that is one of the huge moral dilemmas that we have. And as we become increasingly globalized and aware, 
we have to, and as we increasingly have the capacity to impact the lives of others, we have to keep closing that empathy gap. So the third part of compassion is that it involves taking action. So it involves exactly as you two said, getting into the pond and rescuing that toddler, irrespective of what the impact is on us. So it's a three-stage process. It's awareness, it's an empathetic concern, and that's coupled with action. So compassion is very different, but similar to being kind. You know, a random act of kindness a day is a compassionate thing to do, but that is not compassion. Kindness is in the gift of the bestower. Kindness is wonderful and we all need it. And we know that kindness is one of the key things that will lead to happiness, helping other people. But kindness differs from compassion. Compassion is rooted in the equality of every single human, knowing that every human has equal worth, no matter where they are, no matter our relationship to them, and no matter what side of a conflict they lie on. So compassion involves caring for everyone equally, and it is not in the gift of the bestower. It is not, ah, oh, I'm feeling kind today, so I'm going to stop on my way to work and do something kind for someone else. Compassion is a moral necessity. When we feel compassion, we act irrespective of the consequences. So compassion is the capacity that all of us have, but many of us have lost, that can drive this peace movement and this capacity for peace building. I said I'd tell you something about economists. Um, so they have done studies of undergraduates to see what the... Are there any economists in the room, first of all? Yes, hooray, we have some, some compassionate economists in the room. So if you're in this room, you're already compassionate, I know that. I'm just explaining the science of how compassion works so that you can be more conscious and more, um, more active in, in, in your practice of it. So they've done studies of economists and they, of undergraduates, and they know that the levels of compassion amongst all undergraduate subjects are lowest amongst economists. And furthermore, those economic students who have higher levels, the highest levels of compassion, are more likely to drop out of their studies in their first or second year. So that means that those of us who go in are drawn to subjects like economics, which have a huge impact on issues that drive conflict, like equality, like social justice, often have low levels of compassion. And all that tells us is that we need to do a better job when we educate economists and make sure that we are cultivating the capacity for compassion within them. Anyway, moving on from that, there's one other area that we have to practice compassion. And I'm, I'm delighted to say that tomorrow I will get the chance to talk to you about this more because we'll be doing a practical workshop. So this is Audrey Lord, who's the incredible American civil rights and poet and writer and essayist. She says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So we also have to have compassion for ourselves, because if we don't, we burn out. And if we burn out, we start to depersonalize, and we can no longer have that empathetic concern. It's too much for us. Our whole system shuts down. So part of the practice of compassion is to take care of ourselves in the process so that we're able to be compassionate and to be able to be peace builders and so that we don't burn out. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit about compassion burnout when I move on to the next bit of my talk. But first of all, I just want to kind of sum up about compassion. So what compassion does is it gives us a moral compass. Is something going to take us towards compassion or away from from compassion. You could also ask, is something going to take us towards peace or away from peace? And if we can set our moral compasses with compassion as the magnetic north, then they will guide us towards effective peace building. So am I having compassion? We notice when hate arises. 
We row over to the other person's island. We try and imagine what it is like to be in their experience. We have empathy and we take action. So I'm now going to talk about leadership, which is why you're all here, because I'm very hopeful for what the world is going to look like when you all have your hands on the steering wheel. But for the moment, unfortunately, we have a generation of leaders who, for many reasons, are not acting from a place of compassion. And in the UK, I've worked in the political space for around 30 years, first as a journalist, then I ran for the UK Parliament, then I sat on the national executive of the Green Party in the United Kingdom. So I have the cut and thrust of politics for a long time. And what I realized after the UK voted to leave the European Union for Brexit, as we call it, and what I realized after America voted to install a misogynist, a liar, and a fraudster in the White House, is that there is something wrong with the way we do politics. And that there is something, well, we'll just have a quick look. I don't know if the technician can play the video clip. So this is the UK Parliament. This is the mother, we call ourselves the mother of all democracies, and this is how our political leaders behave. Can we go? Yeah. So that's our former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Shut up a minute. Can you turn it up a bit? I will not tolerate such behaviour. If you want to go out, go out now, but if you stand again, I will order you out. Make your mind up. And then shut up and get out. Okay, I think we've got the flavour. So that is how our political leaders behave in the mother of all democracies. Um, anyone spot what's wrong with that? Everything. What would happen if you behaved in a classroom like that? What would happen if you behaved in a place of work like that? Uh, yeah, you wouldn't be allowed to get away with it. And yet our political leaders behave in ways that no one else in the country would be allowed to behave. And there is something fundamentally wrong with that. I had a very interesting um, argument with a member of the Conservative government because I, one of the things that I do with Compassion in Politics is to campaign for the way that debate is conducted to try and get that reformed so that people sit in a semicircle, they don't stand, they don't shout, they don't make animal noises, they don't boo, they don't jeer, they don't shame, they don't ridicule. You would think it was really first base, but not according to many parliaments. The Australian parliament, I know we've got some Australians here, is no different. Um, and I'm sure that many of you have seen equivalent scenes in your parliament. So I was arguing with a cabinet minister about why this needed to change. And he said, the thing is, you know, I, when I have an idea, I take it to the floor of parliament. And, you know, that's how I test it. I kind of test the mood. You know, I see how people feel about it. And I said, well, if that is the most efficient way you can come up with for testing an idea... Maybe you should take that to the boardrooms of all the multinationals. Maybe global organizations could start testing their ideas in that way. I don't think so. So there is something very, very wrong. You know, if this is the best way that politicians can up, come up with for testing the strength of their ideas, we all know that it is radically wrong. So what can we do about it? Well, we set up... Um, an organization, or can we move on from this one? I think you have to give me back control of my magic wand. Let's get rid of Paul Lindsay Hoyle, the speaker, who clearly had no control over his class. So this is really how we conduct politics at the moment. It's a tug of war between two sides. Again, it's the apportionment of right and wrong. And is it any surprise that politics breaks down and we end up in conflict? No, because the only way of winning this tug of war is to be stronger and heavier 
and use more force than the other side. And that is not how we create peace, yet it's how we prosecute our politics, it's how we reach our decisions, it's how we dominate those we don't agree with. So we think that there is a better way, a way that's inclusive, collaborative, and fit for purpose. Um, so in the UK, we now work, we set up five years ago, and we now work with 100 MPs from every single party working to promote compassion. It's the start of a movement, and we have groups setting up in other countries across the world, really saying, you don't have to leave your political tribe, you don't have to leave your political party, but what you do have to do is set your compass so that compassion is the main priority. Because if you prioritize compassion, if you prioritize alleviating the suffering of another, then you will have a politics that's fit for purpose. And there are all sorts of things that come with that. There's how we conduct ourselves, and there's also what are the outcomes of the political process. So that's what we're up to there. Now, why politics matters, particularly in this forum, is that in this year, 2024, we have over 50 elections happening worldwide. At the same time as we have those elections, we have a rise in extremism. We have a rise in hate, as we've said, and polarization. We have a rise in disinformation. And we have, as yet unknown, the full impact of artificial intelligence, deep fakes. So we have a lot on our hands as we go into these elections. And also we have an increasing turning away, a loss of faith in democracy. Poll after poll shows that people have lost faith in politicians, and it's not surprising, and lost faith in the political process. And that's dangerous. Because if we step away from the political process, we have conflict. So what can all of us in this room do in this crucial year going forward when you will all be ambassadors for peace in your respective institutions, communities, nations? What can you do? So I'm going to talk about the three things that I think can make a difference. Well, in fact, I don't think I know they can make a difference. The first is to connect. Now, why connect? What do I mean by connect? Well, the first thing I mean by connect is that when you're talking to someone here or sitting next to them, ask them how they're doing. Connect at a real level. Don't just connect at a superficial level. Connect one human to another because we all learn the rituals of connection and conversation often starts with those rituals. Hi, where are you from? How did you get here? How did you sleep? Where are you staying? But we have to move one stage beyond that to connect to each other as humans. You know, what's really going on beneath the surface? And that may begin with a formal way, but, but connect more deeply. Show your vulnerability. Talk about what's going on for you and give others the permission to talk about what's going on for them. Get their phone numbers. Start WhatsApp groups. You have an incredible opportunity here. You're here from 47 different nations. Form connections across the globe. Learn from each other. You may not have a deep conversation at this point, but get each other's numbers because you don't know when that connection may be relevant. You have all been put in each other's paths for a reason. You are all here for a reason. Make sure that you equip yourselves to give effect to that reason. You may not know why yet, but at some point you will discover how to be useful. We are all on this planet to be useful, I believe, and we have to get ready so that when the moment for us to be useful comes, we are equipped, we are connected, we know people across the globe, we meet someone who's an asylum seeker from a country that needs help. Ah, we met someone from that country. We met someone from the other side of that border. We've got them in our phone. You don't know how you are all going to be useful to each other, but I can tell you that you will. So connect. There's another reason why connection is important. Um, 
I'm going to do another little quiz because I know it's the end of the day and you're probably feeling a little bit tired and wondering when you can get your next coffee or perhaps something stronger. Um, so I'm going to give you a list of the causes of ill health. So smoking, heart disease, obesity, lack of exercise, lack of connection, what else? Give me another cause of ill health. We've... Alcohol consumption, alcohol and drugs. Thank you. I'm sure you're not saying that from personal experience. No. Good. So, so give me a shout out for what you think the single biggest cause impact on poor health is. Smoking, alcohol, drugs, heart disease, obesity... Hey, some of you have got there. The single biggest cause of ill health or the single biggest thing you can do to improve health is social connection. Studies have found that, that to increase life expectancy by 50%, the single biggest thing that will do that isn't something you can buy. It isn't a, a pharmacy that you have to pay a lot to get from the pharmacist, it is social connection. It is more powerful than giving up smoking, not being obese, taking blood pressure medication. That's not to say that you should stop taking it, but it is more powerful in increasing your life expectancy. So connection is important because you're getting ready, because it will actually help you to live longer, have more resilience and be healthy. And then I'm going to give you the third reason why connection is impossible. There is a fantastic book that many of you may have read by a Yale historian called Timothy Snyder, and it's called On Tyranny. And in it, he talks about those things that were on the slide about the coming election, the rise of tyranny, and the fear he has for our globe. And in it, he identifies connection as one of the ways to combat tyranny. The more connected a community is, the more connected a nation is, the better able it will be to withstand the rise of tyranny. If states collapse, if the worst, our worst fears about climate change are realized, the communities that are able to weather that are able to take care of themselves, that are able to withstand the shocks will be the ones that are most connected. So your job is to connect. Really, really simple. What am I going to do about all these terrible things in the world? I'm going to start connecting. I'm going to connect on an individual basis. I'm going to connect with strangers. I'm going to have random conversations. And I'm going to make sure I'm connected to the place where I live and I facilitate others to be connected as well. Number two, locate. Locate others who feel the same way as you. Create a critical mass and locate solutions. Solutions exist. Locate them, connect with them, sign up for them, become aware of them. If they don't exist, create them. Create a map. Know, know where things that are going to make a difference are happening and connect up with them. And locate your kindred spirits and your fellow travelers and you're in a room full of them right now. And the third thing is to take action. There's a great acronym for action. Action changes things. So when we don't act, we feel disempowered. We feel disengaged. And not acting is really the first step on the superhighway to despair. And when we despair, we disengage. So when we act, we realize that we're not as hopeless and powerless as we feel, and that we all have choices. We have choices in our daily lives. We can choose to cross the street, to act with compassion. We can choose to sign the petition. We can choose to spend the money that we do have in ways that reward climate-friendly operators. We have multiple choices. 
We can choose to stand up when we see someone else being bullied. And we can choose to take our role as peacemakers seriously and take ourselves on that journey. So when we feel overwhelmed by the suffering that we see in the world, we have a recipe. We have three things that we can do and three things that we can encourage other people to do and three things that we can, many of you in this room are already doing, but that we can do on a daily basis. Connect, locate, look out for what's happening. Where is there a kindred spirit? Where is there something or someone that I can support or help to move things forward? And how can I act? And then when that all feels a bit overwhelming, because we can feel that it's down to each of us to try and turn the tide of history, it isn't. It's down to all of us together. But I love this quote from Emily Dickinson. I have it on my desk. If I can stop one human heart from breaking, I will not have lived in vain. So we can try and turn the tide of history, but if at the end of all our struggles we manage to just stop one other human heart from breaking, that will have been enough for our life. So thank you all for listening to me. Thank you all for being here.